today is our fifth and final installment in our Armor of God series that we've been working through. And so what we have, just again to review, what we've been reviewing every single week during this series is we've got this outline of the book of Ephesians, right? And the first half of Ephesians, the first three chapters are all all theological about the blessings of salvation in Christ. And we could spend months going through some of this stuff in there. And then the second half of the book is all about character. How do we live in light of these amazing theological truths in the first half of the book? And then what this series is all about is this, is this famous armor of God passage in Ephesians chapter 6, which is just a, a creative summary of the last part of the book, which is about character. And so we've talked over and over again in this series how the armor of God is actually just talking about the character of God. So for now on, for the rest of your life, whenever you hear someone talk about the armor of God, you know what that actually means in the context of Ephesians? It means to live with the character of God. When you live with the goodness and grace and peace and integrity and all that, and love that God has for us, when we live in those ways, we live in the example that God gave us, that is how we put on the armor of God. That is the armor of God, is living and behaving that way. And I want to show you this from yet another passage in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5 starts out this way. Paul says, follow God's example. Now that's a, by the way, this is a very interesting statement for Paul to make. There's a bunch of places in the New Testament where Paul says, follow my example. But this is one of the only, there's only a couple of places. In fact, this is the most overt way he says it. But there's a couple other places where he alludes to it. But this is, this is different than follow my example. Paul says, actually, we are to follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children. And this is the context in which the armor of God passage comes. It's this whole idea in the book of Ephesians that we are supposed to live according to God's example. We're supposed to behave like God behaves and have the character that God has. Now, um, you've noticed here that I've left off part of this verse, and there's a reason for that. Because the question right away comes, okay, follow God's example. Well, there's lots of stories in the Bible about God. And there's lots of stories in the Old Testament in particular where God does some very wrathful things, right? I mean, Genesis 6 to 7, I mean, there's many, but just to pick out a couple, Genesis 6 to 7, God drowns all of humanity except for one family because of their wickedness. So when Paul says, follow God's example, there might be some Christians who look at some of the stories, particularly in the Old Testament, where God is very harsh or angry or violent towards his enemies or towards those who disobey, some Christians might pick up on that and they might say, okay, following God's example includes some of those stories and that means as Christians, we need to be harsh and aggressive and angry against sinners and sin. But Paul, knowing that, is going to get more specific it's, just, it's not just follow God's example. I left off the rest of this verse here. He's going to be at specific what part of example, because there's lots of stories in here we can follow. What part of God's example are we meant to follow as believers? And he goes on to say this, and walk in the way of love, so that's instructive, just as Christ loved us. Now, I've left off even one more piece because he's going to get even more specific than this. But let's just look at this for a moment. One of the things we often say here at Crossview, and it's what our name is, it's, it's everything that this church is based around. Crossview uh, is this idea that, and it's not an idea that's new to us, it's all over the New Testament, and Paul is affirming it again here, is that Jesus is the ultimate revelation of who God is. Jesus is the ultimate revelation. So when Paul says, follow God's example, he's not just saying, okay, go anywhere in the book, in in the Bible, and find an example of God and do that. So if you find a place where God is harshly judging sinners, then you're a Christian, follow God's example and harshly judge sinners. No, no, Paul is going to specify, and he's going to say, no, no, when I talk about God, I'm talking, and, and the example that we are to follow, I'm talking specifically about the ultimate revelation of God that we have, which is Jesus Christ. So follow God's example and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us. Now, we have to get even more specific because, and I've heard many Christians say things like this, if we read in the Gospels, 
we can also find some interesting, angry outbursts that Jesus has. So, for example, we have the whole temple clearing uh, incident. We'll call it an incident, which is recorded in all four Gospels, which makes it seem like it happened more than it did. It only happened once, but it's recorded four times in the Gospels. And that's where Jesus goes into the temple and loses his temper. And in one of the accounts, he makes a whip, but whatever the case is, he physically drives the money changers out of the temple, and he gets angry, and he's physically angry and violent. And I've actually heard Christians sometimes reference that story and go, this is, and we need to follow Jesus' example, so part of following Jesus' example is sometimes we have to get almost violent, we have to get aggressive and angry and harsh with sin and sinners, All right, but Paul is actually going to get even more specific than that. Not only when he said God's example, he's not telling us to follow just anything, you know, anything God has done in the Bible. When he says, specifically it's Jesus' example we're supposed to be following, he's going to get even more specific as to which part of Jesus' life are we as Christians meant to follow. He says this, Follow the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Paul has gotten specific three times. Follow God's example. And by that I mean specifically Jesus' example. And by that specifically I mean Paul is not saying, hey, Jesus got angry a couple of times, so go out and be angry like Jesus. By the way, Jesus is the perfect son of God. He knows how to handle his anger. We get warned repeatedly in the New Testament that anger is a dangerous thing. And so Paul specifies one more time and he says, and I don't just mean anything in Jesus' life, specifically the sort of definitive act of Jesus' life, which was his ultimate act of obedience to the Father, which was to give himself up for us. Paul says as Christians, that's the example we are to follow is to model our lives as Christians after what Jesus did for us on the cross. And that is what Paul is asking us to do. And this is the context in which we get the armor of God instructions. By the way, this is yet another reason I've been showing you. I, I mean, we could take months and go through every verse in every chapter of Ephesians. We can't. I've just been giving you highlights over the last five weeks, but we've, been, we've looked at you know, large swaths of chapter one, two, three, five, and six. But one of the things I've been telling you over and over again is sometimes how the armor of God passage gets used by Christians today is it's sort of this call to war, this sort of call to battle. It's like we talk about the armor of God and it's like this like rile us up to go to war with evil in general out in our culture. But actually, the context of Ephesians is the opposite. We are meant to do the opposite of go to war. We are meant to give ourselves up. Our lives as Christians, as Christ followers, is meant to, this is the way we deal with the culture around us and evil and sin, is we give ourselves up like Christ did. Now, the next question might be, well, does this mean it's okay to sin? And the answer is, obviously, no. You know, it's interesting with Jesus. Let's just, uh, let's just take a quick little rabbit trail here. And then we're going to look at the breastplate of righteousness. But if we look at Jesus in the, in, the, in the New Testament and just look actually at his example. First of all, he doesn't get angry as often as some Christians think he does. I mentioned that before. There's the temple incident, which gets repeated four times. There's also the incident in Matthew 23, where he you know, tears a strip off the Pharisees, you know, collective backs and calls them, you know, a brood of snakes and vipers. But it's very interesting to me, if you actually pay attention to Jesus in the Gospels, there is one group of people, when he gets angry, he's always angry at one group. And he's never angry at a different group. And I think this is actually really instructive because it often kind of just gets thrown around. Like we kind of talk about Jesus and some of his emotions, but not actually pay attention to what the actual stories are saying. When Jesus does get angry, and it's not as often as some people think, 
It's always against one group, and it's never against another group. So which is the group of people when Jesus is angry that he is always angry against? And the answer is, in every case, it's the same group. It's his fellow religious leaders. He's a religious leader. I mean, not in the same way as they are, but he's a spiritual leader. He's a leader. It's his, and he comes out of the Pharisaical sect, people who took the scriptures very seriously. He's always angry at religious leaders who are using their authority as religious leaders to oppress the people and keep them from receiving God's mercy and grace. And who is he never angry with? He's never angry with the unbelievers who are all around him. When he meets the, you know, the woman at the well who's already through five marriages and living with her boyfriend, you know, modern day Christian might say, okay, we got to stand up for the truth here. We got to go. What does Jesus do? He sits and talks to her, then tells her, you know, go get your husband. Let's talk. She's like, well, I'm not married. He says, yeah, I know you're, you're living with your boyfriend. Go bring him back and let's talk. He goes to lunch with Zacchaeus, who's just, you know, bad person, tax collector, bad, bad people in those days. I'm sure tax collectors, if you're here today and you're a tax collector, I was going to say we love you. That might be a lie, but, <laughs> but you're not a bad person. I don't even know if those exist anymore, right? But, but whatever the case, um, you know, he's with tax collectors. You know, the woman caught in adultery. Now, he never condones sin. Absolutely not. Never once does Jesus condone sin or say that sin is okay. But even, you know, the woman caught in adultery, the religious leaders come to him and they say, you got to come down hard. If ever you're going to come down hard, come down hard now. This woman was caught in the act. And what does he do? He stops them from coming down hard and then sends her away with one simple sentence, go and sin no more. So who was Jesus angry with? Who was he not angry with? Tie that together with, follow Christ's example as he gave us, himself up for us in the armor of God. And we have a very different picture here than what some Christians have gotten this idea that we're supposed to be riled up and going to war with the sinners around us. Now, as I said before, this doesn't mean that we're, this doesn't mean that we go soft on sin. Part of the armor, the second piece of armor is the breastplate of righteousness. Stand firm then with a belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. So righteousness there, this is an important piece of the Christian's armor, is to live right, to live with integrity and, and high moral character. Again, remember what I've been saying throughout this series. Spiritual warfare is not something different you do where you go out there and you, and you do this spiritual warfare stuff. It's when you live right, that's the armor. When you live with integrity and high moral character, that is the act. When you do right when nobody's looking, when you refuse to take you know, advantage of an employee or a customer when you could, when you tell the truth even when it hurts your case or, your, or you know, what you're trying to do, when you do those things, that is putting on the breastplate of, of, of righteousness. And according to Paul, living right is a protection. The breastplate was something that was, you know, is worn over your chest to protect your heart and your vital organs. When you live right, Paul is saying, that is a protection for your life. And when you live wrong, it's like taking the protection off. I mean, how many times, how many, you know, over years of ministry, and, and, and many of you as well, you've known people where when you make, you know, one of those choices, whether it be, you know, and I, I'm thinking of actual examples of, of ones I've known where Christians have created, you know, uh, or, or committed fraud, and then years later they got caught. You know, they stole or they abused someone, and it comes out later. And when it comes out, when you do wrong... Later when it comes out, not, not to mention the stress for months or years, you're hiding this secret. You're sitting on it. You're covering it up and it's stressful. The breastplate of righteousness, when you live with high character and you have nothing to be afraid of, you can go to bed at night and assuming you don't have some other issues like you drank coffee or, you're, or you have little kids or whatever, but it, you know, then the breastplate of righteousness doesn't even help you to sleep. All right, that's just Whatever. You'll get sleep in 15 years when they, when they grow up and leave the house. But, but no, but the breastplate of righteousness is I can go to bed with a clean conscience. 
without stress. There's nothing in my past, there's nothing going on in my life right now that if it came to light would blow things up in my life. That's the breastplate of righteousness. It's a protection for you. Now, sometimes, uh, you know, Christians, I, and I need to make this, I need to make this little rabbit trail, this little caveat here, but sometimes people, you know, Christians, when it comes to the breastplate of righteousness, it's like your anxiety turns up and you're thinking the breastplate of righteousness is like the breastplate of perfection. This is not the breastplate of perfection. This is the breastplate of righteousness. You say, what's the difference? Well, first of all, nobody here is perfect. No human being other than Jesus Christ will ever be perfect until the resurrection. That's just a fact. We all make mistakes. We all do dumb stuff. Now, some Christians, when their anxiety and their guilt and condemnation kind of goes into overdrive, they hear a message about the breastplate of righteousness, and it's like, oh shoot, like a couple of days ago, I said something at work, I don't know if it was 100% true, and they're like, oh, maybe that was a lie, maybe God, like I sold that car, and I, you know, I gave full disclosure, but I didn't tell them about that, you know, that one little hole in the carpet at the back, and I've actually had conversations like this with people. And I know what this feeling is like, because I walked in that for years as a young man, constantly worried. That little thing I just did, did I just do something? You know, I, I remember literally thinking at times in my 20s, if I would drive a few kilometers over the speed limit and then be worried, I literally would have thoughts sometimes like, well, God's not going to answer my prayers to keep me safe on this drive because I lost that protection when I went over the speed limit. Now, if that, by the way, if that's how God worked and he was that petty, half of us here would have already been wiped out. You sped and cursed on the way to church this morning, and it's Sunday morning. <laughs> it, so we get, in the breastplate of righteousness, we get on this thing. It's like we think it's the breastplate of perfection, and we have this, like, anxious sort of loop in our heads that if any little thing I do, you know, I hit my hand with a thumb, you know, my hand with a thumb. <laughs> I hit my hammer with a thumb the other day, and I hit my thumb with a hammer, and a swear word came out. Oh, you know, God's not going to protect me or answer my prayers for the next couple of days, whatever it is. This is not what Paul's talking about. The breastplate of righteousness is not, the, is not the breastplate of perfection, and you are forgiven by God. There's a difference that we as Christians need to understand between big things and imperfection and daily imperfections. Because you are forgiven. By God, you are forgiven. But there's a difference, and sometimes we as Christians, we talk in a way that I don't think we tr truly understand that there is this distinction. There is a difference, and I'm not saying small things don't matter. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying there's regular life. And there's a huge difference between, uh, well, let me just, let's just get like super obvious, because I sometimes hear Christians say things like, all sin is sin, all sin is created equal, or whatever, is all sin is equal. No, it isn't. There is a huge difference between murder, rape, and, and killing children than speeding or you told a little exaggeration or a lie. I'm not saying little things don't matter, but we can actually all just agree here, there's a huge difference. And we know there's a huge difference because when we read about some of these heinous acts in the newspaper, we're horrified. And, our, and we cry out for justice. There needs to be justice for this because horrible things have been done. When someone goes, you know, 10 kilometers over the speed limit, we're like, well, okay, let's just be safe. But we don't cry out for justice. Our hearts don't cry out for justice. Why? There is actually a difference. I sometimes say this when I preach, but if you had a choice before you today and, and you know, someone came to you and said, you have to sin today, you must. And I don't know, I don't, I don't know the crazy scenario that would lead to this. But let's just say, hypothetical situation. You must sin today. And you're like, ah, done already, okay? <laughs> We're like, no, 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 you have to do one more. You have to do one more sin today. And you have to choose between, between telling a lie or murdering 10 people. What would you choose? And if any of you chooses B, I want you to stand up and go outside right now and wait for me after the service. <laughs> and we're going to call the cops. Because that's bad. <laughs> All right? Pick the lie. All sin is not created equal. Okay? So there are sins... Okay? So I'm not saying little things don't matter. But what I'm saying is we all sin... And yes, all sin has some damaging effect. Yes, yes, yes. But the breastplate of righteousness, not talking about little sins. When you hit your hammer, you know, your hammer, I keep saying that, but when you hit your thumb with a hammer and swear, not that I'm encouraging this. I can see that one going under the coffee shops. Chris says you should swear when you hit your hand, you know, hand with a hammer. I, fine, no. But when you swear because you hit your thumb with a hammer, 
that's not going to come back later in your life and be this big reveal that destroys your marriage and your family. They're going to go, that's the worst you said in that moment? Like, wow. But there are other ones, fraud, murder, abuse, adultery, whatever it is. There are other ones, there are sins that have the power to blow your life up. And Paul's not talking here about being perfect every breath of your life. He's saying the breastplate of righteousness, there are choices that you can make that have the power to blow things up and it can be radioactive and the pain and the poison that it causes can go on for years on end. And the breastplate of righteousness is the one that I can go to bed at night knowing that there's nothing, there's no hidden suitcase bomb in my life that's going to take me or my family or my business out down down the road. I've got the breastplate of righteousness on. I've been making these choices. And as I was getting ready for this sermon this week, I thought to myself, you know, there might be, in fact, I don't even doubt that there is. There might be someone here this morning or watching online who you are right now in a place of high pressure. Runaway anxiety, financial pressure, whatever it is. But there's stuff, and there's a, there's a shortcut that's becoming really tempting to you right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this thing, and some of the stories I've heard. And I'm just going to do this thing. I'm going to take advantage of my partner. He'll never find out. Or I'm going to move this money around over here. And I know it's illegal, but, you know, I'll just cover it up like this. Or whatever it is, I'm going to cheat someone or on someone. I'm going to do this. And if you're thinking that right now, Let God speak to you in this sermon this morning. Don't do it. The breastplate of righteousness is there to protect you. And whatever you think you're going to do in the short term that's going to make things better, in the long term it's going to leave you open to something that's going to hurt a lot. Don't do it. Now, the second thing I want you to notice about this breastplate of righteousness is a breastplate is a purely defensive weapon. It's not even a weapon. I mean, it's a piece of armor, but it's purely defensive. It goes over your chest to protect your organs. You don't hit anyone with it once you have it on. They do that in football, but I don't know why, but... You don't take it off and smack someone with it. I want you to notice, Paul is very intentional. This isn't, he, he's intentional with this whole metaphor of the armor and the character of God. He's very intentional. It's not the hammer of righteousness. If, it, if, if righteousness was something we were supposed to go on the offensive with, he could have made this a sword or a hammer or a stick, or something, a bow and arrow, anything. He doesn't. Righteousness is not something you hit other people over the head with. It's something you live and it protects you. And that's a really important thing because that's another thing I think we as Christians are tempted sometimes to fall into is we want to use righteousness as a weapon in the culture wars. We want to use righteousness. We want to use what we believe is right and we want to bang other people over the head with it, either to make them feel guilty or, either, or to make them do what we think they should do. When Paul says, put on the armor of God, the righteousness is a breastplate. You put this on and you're protected. This is not for beating others over the head with. This is not for attacking others with. In fact, Paul goes on to say, uh, I'm going to go back to Ephesians, like we talked in Ephesians 5 there, but following God's example. Look what he says right in the next verse after the ones I showed you. He says this, oh, defense piece of armor. There, you got it? Take a quick picture. Notes. Um, It's also up here. Ephesians 5, but among you, who's the you there? Christians. Now it's us. Paul's talking to a little group of Christians in the city of Ephesus almost 2,000 years ago. Now it includes us. But among you, right? This is not about everybody else. This is not about the Roman Caesar. This is not about the Roman culture, which was incredibly debauched and immoral. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality because there was a lot of sexual immorality in Ephesus specifically and in the Roman culture. In Ephesus, among the the temple worship, they also had 
emperor worship. They had all kinds of pagan worship in Ephesus. And in some of that worship was they had prostitution in the temples. Some of that religion and, and those offerings were directly tied to all kinds of sexual immorality. And Paul doesn't even call any of that out. He just says, among you. I know you're surrounded by a bunch of stuff that's not good, but among you, I'm not talking to everybody else, but among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for who? Well, I mean, technically, they're improper for everyone. Yes, sure. But notice, that's not what Paul says because they are improper for God's holy people. Paul clearly has a different standard for someone who follows Christ and someone who doesn't follow Christ. That's actually really important for us to think about. It's sad, in many cases, I think, that that distinction isn't actually reality. I think many times, actually, we Christians fail to live to a higher standard than the non-Christians around us. But at the very least, Paul says, there's supposed to be a distinction. He's like, I'm not calling the pagans around you to live to this standard. They're not followers of Christ. Why would they listen to me anyway? Why would they listen to God's word? They don't believe in God's word. He's like, I'm not calling them to this standard. I'm calling you because these are improper for you are supposed to be at a different standard for God's holy people. For God's holy people. That's what we are meant to be. Now, sometimes I think this is such a relevant message that Ephesians has for us leading into Christmas. Because we're all going to be spending time with family, some of whom are God's holy people and some of who are not. Even if they call themselves Christians, right? Like some of you are like, yeah. But you're going to be with people this month and it's going to be easy to engage in the culture wars and get upset about differences we think this or differences we think that. And it's very important for us to remember that Paul's call to us of holiness and righteousness is for us. He does not lay this on everybody else. Doesn't mean that everybody else, that hey, we wish other people would live that standard as well. But I first actually just wish that we Christians could live to it. That'd be a great first step. So now you say, well, does this mean we can never speak up about issues that we care about? If, if the breastplate of armor is a defensive piece of armor, would Paul be against, would the Apostle Paul say, well, you can never speak up about issues that, ma like, that matter to you as a Christian because it's just defensive, just live it and don't talk about it. I don't think Paul would say that. I wish we could bring Paul 2,000 years in the future and have him speak specifically into our culture and context. This is where we have to kind of wrestle with things. I think, I think we can speak up about truth, but how we do it, I think, is very important. And if we're going to do it in a way that models Christ's death on the cross, here's four thoughts that I have. Let's wrestle with them together. You take a moment, pray about them, and let's see if this matches up with what the Spirit is saying to us for 2023. How to stand for truth without going to war. Because remember, we're not called to go to war. We're called to stand. We're called to follow Christ's example to die. So how do we stand for truth without going to war? The first thing is we just have to come to accept in our hearts that non-Christians don't need to live like Christians. This is a free country. This is, by the way, what it means to live in a free country. And I'm so glad that we live in a free country. I'm so glad we don't live in a country where we, who do not believe in, in Islam, are forced, like in some countries, to believe and practice Islam. I'm glad. Aren't you glad that we don't, we're not forced to do that against our conscience? At the same time, though, Jesus gave us the golden rule. He said, do unto others what you would have them do to you. So you know what that means? That means if I'm glad I don't live in a country where I have to do what a Muslim does and believe like a Muslim does, I'm also glad to live in a country where we don't make Muslims live like Christians or believe like Christians, aren't you? And the same with atheists. And the same with Hindus. That's the golden rule. So we need to accept that non-Christians 
don't need to live like Christians. You know what happens? Now, I think some of us can say this in our minds. I don't know that all of us can say this in our hearts. Because the moment you actually believe this, a lot of the tension goes out of the anger. Where you're so upset every day in the news, and why are you upset? Because non-Christians aren't living like Christians. Paul didn't expect them to. Someday, Jesus is going to come to earth, and we're all going to live. I was going to say, like Christians, thank God, it'll be a lot higher standard than that. But Jesus is going to come to earth, and we're all going to live like Jesus. In the meantime, we can let the anger out of the tub when non-Christians don't live and believe the way we live and believe. Here's another way to stand for truth without going to war. Reason with people based on shared goals and assumptions, not the Bible. When we're here in church, we accept we're here for God's word. Because we believe the Bible and we believe in Jesus. So, yes, then we should talk about the Bible. When you go outside of these walls, which is not, where 98% of your life is spent, and where most of your mission is, this is just the encouragement to go out there. Other people don't care about the Bible, so why are you upset that they're not following the Bible? Can you imagine if someone ran a campaign here in Canada, a Muslim ran a campaign and said, hey, in the Quran, there's, you're not allowed to eat pig, so I'm running on a platform of no pork or bacon in the, in the supermarkets here in Canada. I mean, I would have a hairy fit. <laughs> you can't take away my bacon. You can't take away my pork chops marinated for an entire day in that salty brine my wife makes. Like, wow. And barbecued on a thing. Yeah, but the Quran says so. Yeah, I don't believe the Quran. And one of the reasons is I love bacon. <laughs> There's more than that. But it doesn't hurt, right? In the same way, when we talk about things that matter to us as Christians, it's not that we can't talk about it. How does Stanford Truth about going to war? But when we talk about it, it's not club you over the head with the Bible. Hey, I don't think we should have abortion. All right, why? Now you've got to come in with a reasonable argument. Not because the Bible, da 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 and I'm a Christian. That doesn't mean anything. Now you've got to learn a little bit. You have to listen. Why do you think it should be a thing? Well, I think it shouldn't be. And now you're talking about, well, what is this? Are there, you know, are there consequences for women? Are there consequences for children? Are there, you know, what are some of the factors that are causing this? And you have a reasonable and educated uh, uh, conversation. And at the end of it, if they don't agree with you, you let it go emotionally without getting angry and calling them evil. How to stand for truth without going to war. The breastplate of righteousness is ours to wear, not to beat others with. Doesn't mean we're silent. It just means the way we do it is different. And then that brings up a third thing. Let it go. Let it go. Don't bother me anymore or something like that. I forget how the words all go. <laughs> let it go. Our job, not let it go in the terms of you change what you think or you hide what you believe, but let go of the emotions that say, everyone who doesn't agree with me is bad and evil, and we have to stop them. Let it go. Our job is to be the light, not force other people to follow the light. How to stand for truth without going to war. We're called to follow Christ's example. Did Jesus go to war with the sinful culture around him? He did not. He went to them and died for them. By the way, the them is us. We were his enemies before he came and died. And that brings up the final, fourth and final thing, which is this. Cross, pun intended, the divide. Identify with your, quotes are intentional, enemies. Remember this verse we looked at. And walk in the way of love. Just as Christ, that's our example, loved us and gave himself up for us, that's what we're meant to do. What did Jesus do when he was in heaven? Did he yell from heaven, you bunch of idiot sinners, I'm done with you. You're all evil, ignorant, terrible people, blah, 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 strike us dead. 
No, what did he do? He didn't yell at us. He crossed the divide between heaven and earth. And he lived among us for 30 years without preaching. The preaching came after. 30 years, he just lived with us. Cross the divide. He went from heaven and he came to earth to live among his enemies. Paul actually calls us before we're, we're, we've, we're saved enemies of the gospel. He crosses the divide. He lives among us. He feels our pain. He feels what it's like to be a human being. He feels what it's like to be tempted. He feels what it's like to be tired. He feels what it's like to be rejected. He feels all of those things. He walks. He takes walk a mile in someone else's shoes. He takes that to the next level. He walks hundreds of miles. He walks 30 years in our shoes. And then at the end of it, he still doesn't strike us down. He doesn't put us up on the cross. He gets up on the cross. Paul says, guys, this is as Christians, this is like the core of Christian discipleship. What I'm telling you right now is the core. You can put together all kinds of discipleship magazines and pamphlets and programs, how to disciple someone to be a good Christian. This is the core. We're meant to be like Christ, specifically the dying part. Don't we wish it was the other parts, like telling storms to be quiet and yelling at Pharisees? Cross the divide, identify with your enemies. I think of how opposite this is from what so many Christians are tempted to do today, which is on every topic in a polarized society, I don't know what's more relevant. I think Jesus is more relevant today than he's ever been where every topic is polarized and every topic is characterized by groups of people standing and yelling at each other and thinking the other group is ignorant and evil. And both sides legitimately think the other one is evil and ignorant. Jesus looks at this and goes, I gave you the example. Stop yelling. Doesn't mean you have to agree with everybody, but walk to the other side and walk a mile in their shoes. And then I was going to say, and then yell at them. Oh, no, wait. And then die for them. I'm going to finish with a story. One of the most powerful stories I ever heard. Actually, I read. And Gregory Boyd shares a a powerful story in his book, Cross Vision. And in the book, he shares a story about a missionary couple that he knew in the 80s who went overseas and they went to Africa, and this one, I don't know which, in which country, but they went to Africa, and there was this one tribe in Africa that, based on their religious beliefs, practiced female circumcision, which is a terrible practice. It's horrible. It's, and it's practiced in many different places in the world still today. It's a horrible thing. It's, it's, it's a human rights abuse. It's really terrible. Anyway, so this couple goes to this tribe, and they know in advance that this tribe practices female circumcision. Now, what are you going to do in a case like that? How are you going to help these people? Well, I know how most people will help these people. Stay away. Just let it be a story you read about in a magazine. You're disgusted with it. I wish they would change. You could go there and yell at them because what they're doing is legitimately bad. You could just go over there and tell them, you're a bunch of immoral, this is sick, you're ignorant. You might even have a grain of salt of truth in some of those accusations. And you could just hammer them. What you're doing is a human rights abuse. It's awful. You need to stop. Guess what would happen if you did that? Nothing. This couple did something shocking. They went and lived among these people and they were horrified by this practice. But the first thing they saw was that lots of girls were getting even more hurt, not just by the procedure itself, but the fact that they were not using clean instruments to do the the circumcision. So one of the first things this couple did, and it's like, oh, and they got flack for it 
is they provided clean instruments. He said, you're helping these people actually do some evil. And they said, they're doing it. We want to help lessen some of the pain. We can't make them stop. They helped them have new, cleaner procedures. And they worked in this tribe. And imagine how this looks from the outside. Also, imagine the trauma this couple's going through as they try to minister to this tribe and change something. Think of the love. Think of, by the way, what Jesus did for us. He's in pure, good, holy heaven. And he crosses the divide and he comes and lives in the midst of the sin. And he gets sin all over him. Sin and mess and gunk. This couple goes in and they're actually in it. They try to make it better. They take some flack. But they win these people's trust and they actually save some lives in the meantime. And they're there long enough. I don't know how many years it was, but it was a number of years. It wasn't a week. It wasn't a month. It wasn't some quick thing in and out. They gave their lives in this tribe. And eventually, the people in this tribe saw, there is something different about you. Gave their lives to Christ. And at that point, these people were able to say, we got to stop this practice. And it stopped. Wow. That is a cross-shaped life. We don't beat our enemies over the head with the breastplate of righteousness. We cross the divide. We walk a mile or two or 3,000 in their shoes. And when we finally love them enough that they can see it, we maybe might be able to have a little impact and actually change some things. So here's how I want to finish this. I want you just to bow your heads and close your eyes. And let's just have a moment to just reflect before Jesus here today. The last piece of armor that we would talk about in this series actually comes right after the breastplate of righteousness. And you know what it is? It's the, it's the shoes fitted with the gospel of peace. This Christmas... We pray, Father, for a new way of living as Christians. Not Christians wielding the hammer of righteousness, but Christians protected by the breastplate of righteousness, living cross-shaped lives. Walking into groups of people that are nothing like us and loving them until they can see your love for them. That's what the Christmas story is all about. You did it to, for us. You came to us. We commit ourselves this Christmas and for 2024, we want to go now to them. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen.